Uh, my name is Ray Trank. Uh, I'm from Pasco, Rhode Island. I'm a member of the Boroughville Town Council. Now I'll turn this on. That's complicated code, same as my luggage. <laughs> okay. So, so the first thing is that we've gone around the state as, as a town and asked other towns to endorse or to create resolutions uh, in support of us. And the first question uh, that we got in 31 cities and towns in Rhode Island is, well, why don't you just vote against it? The lack of local control is an issue that's uh, statewide. It, it is uh, absolutely... Um, imperative and and the fact of the matter is a community hosting a huge electrical or any energy facility could be on the hook for up to 50 years if you include uh, decommissioning and construction of a 40-year energy facility and that's a huge commitment for a for a community and there should be some local control some if you will what's been said so far today some say in the matter I, I don't know uh, how sensible it is to have a process where the local community, the host community, if you will, has no control and really no extra input uh, into the process. And someone mentioned about the 30-year aspect of the, of the law. Well, the, the law doesn't take into account, uh, as an example, at a recent hearing, the, uh, the energy producer that wants to build a power plant in Barville was talking about public safety issues from the town of Barville. The town of Barville doesn't have public safety. We don't have fire departments. Those, those um, things that are quirky to Rhode Island, uh, water districts, um, sewer committees, fire departments, should be included in the, in, the, uh, in the legislation. There shouldn't be an, op a, 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 an occasion where a fire department can apply to be an intervener. They should immediately be contacted because that's the fire control, fire protection for the community that the, that the energy producer wants to move into. And it's an afterthought in this legislation. Maybe they'll get an intervenership, maybe they won't, maybe they'll get contacted, maybe they won't. Uh, th those are the type of things that are, that are uh, germane to Rhode Island that need to be included. Uh, a few people before me mentioned the expansion of the committee, and I agree with that. I, I think that basic energy projects, a few poles, uh, underground versus above ground, can probably be done by a three-member committee. I would consider those routine uh, applications. But an application that's millions of dollars, perhaps in the future even billions of dollars, needs to have an expanded uh, committee, seven, nine, 11. I've, I like all of those numbers. But one thing I'd like to suggest, well, two things actually, in this area, is one that when a, 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 a Rhode Island state director is on the hook to be on this committee, I would like to see that say, director and or their designee. Because what you've got now is you have a PUC that's uh, run by uh, one person. When, 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 this, uh, when this situation comes up to PUC, you have one person, a one-person PUC board. Uh, you have somebody right now who's in charge of DEM, which it is a, I, I, I think that's a fantastically large job, running DEM for the state of Rhode Island, and is also involved in this. Todd, correct me if I'm wrong. Are we talking about hundreds of thousands of documents at this point? Pages of documents. At the, so we have many, many documents. Of Many of those are multiple pages. And we have three people trying to read those. I'll be honest with you. I've read 45, 45 full documents. I see everything. And I, you know, I read it like this. Okay, and I'm all done with that. But... Um, but when you put a person who's got, already got a very responsible, very difficult job and ask them to, to uh, consider uh, hours and hours of testimony, whether it be uh, public testimony or it be um, professional testimony, and read thousands, hundreds of thousands of pages, um, I, I don't see how that can get done. And so if a designee were appointed, they could keep the director uh, advised, but it would give an opportunity for an assistant director or a director of some department within that department, the opportunity to, to cut their teeth, if you will, and throw themselves into these projects full time. 
I think that's uh, very important. Um, the other thing is that, and, and I don't know um, because I haven't seen it, but it looks like most of the um, clerical and support comes from the PUC. I think in any new legislation that the Energy Facility and Exciting Board should have its own uh, clerical staff or clerical person and or person who's um, uh, running the day-to-day -day activities. Because again, taking someone from the PUC who's got a tremendously responsible position and saying, we're throwing this on your plate, I think that's way too much. I think uh, if you're looking at uh, ways of raising revenue from the uh, energy producers or whatever, I think one of the things is to have a separate um, uh, administrative uh, uh, group that, that does the day-to-day -day of these large projects. Like I said, I think the smaller projects are able to be run on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, the other thing is I'm not a big reinvent the wheel type. I, I like to look at things that work and use those and not start from scratch and try to, you know, uh, uh, you know, invent things. And the federal government has a process for this, which some of the things that they do, we don't do. Uh, as an example, any, any major energy uh, application for FERC is going to have an um, environmental impact statement. Now, uh, the people have asked many, many times for an environmental impact statement, and the answer is, well, you know, it's not, it's not necessary. Well, I think it's most absolutely necessary. Um, and so we don't have to invent the wheel. FERC does it. Let's look at their regulations and how they handle these big projects before we, before we uh, um, create any other legislation. Now, finally, I think, it's, I think it's important to note that um, although public comment can be uh, relevant or irrelevant, one of the things that was recently done by this Energy Facility Siting Board was the, and I don't know if you've ever, you're familiar with the map, the map of Rhode Island with the green on it, and those are the 31 communities and the communities from outside of Rhode Island in Connecticut and Massachusetts that, um, that are uh, against this power plant. Their uh, resolutions were deemed to be public comment. They, they were not given the, the uh, gravity that communities, for the most part, unanimously um, elected in their town council chambers to uh, make these resolutions and to um, send them to Todd, which he's got a 31 of those. Um, and to the governor and, and other places. And uh, so, so I think that um, when we're talking about local control, we should talk about state local control so that um, in the future when we have these uh, discussions, that if communities were to get together and support each other, that their efforts would not be downgraded uh, to public comment because I believe that when a, uh, when a town council, city council, takes action unanimously, makes a resolution and sends it, uh, in some cases, in Exeter's case, to the entire state of Rhode Island, that it should be given that gravity and not, and not uh, um, turned into a public comment. Thank you, any questions for Councilman Trank? Yes, Ms. Dr. Bianco. Uh, I, my arm hurts I do this. Um, I just, um, Wanna thank you for your comments and this in no way affects the um the value of your comments. I just I think we've reached many tens of thousands of pages. I don't know if we've crossed the hundred thousand mark. Tens of thousands. But I many stand tens correct. of thousands is it's a lot. I think I think the point stands. But I so tens of thousands, I'll accept that. Any further questions for Mr. Trank? Yes, Mr. Rosselli. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um Ray, uh, uh, Councilman Trank. Uh, um so, so, so help me out a little bit on, and, uh, and maybe illustrate a little bit more about the, the loss of local control. Uh, so you as a town council person uh, have to subscribe, the town has to subscribe to certain regulations, whether they be statewide already, right? I mean, st um, um, uh, statewide planning, DEM, uh, wetland setbacks, uh, environmental rules and regulations. And certainly, planning and zoning has to has to adhere to those too. How does 
does this, how does the, uh, uh, how, how has your um, uh, interaction with the EFSB this past couple of years, and also being on the town council, how would you characterize that interaction between all the things you have to uh, adhere to uh, statewide and now all of a sudden you're asked to do something else. Well, I, I, think it, I, I think it's at both ends of the spectrum. I think you heard earlier about the garage. And the fact of the matter is, if you want to build a garage at your house in Boroughville, you have to submit a plan. You have to get DEM permission if, you, if it is wetlands. You, there's a variety of things you have to do in order to build a garage. The current res legis legislation doesn't call for any of that. And for some reason, th 30 years ago, the people that made the legislation bought into the argument that that's how it's done in energy. That's how it's done. We don't have to give a plan. There's 52 separate buildings that are planned to be built at this power plant. There are two sketches out of the 52. So therefore, the uh, Invenergy company could not build a garage in the town of Oroville. That's, that's this end. That's the, the, the end that people can understand that where are the plans for this? Where is the plan for this building? Where is the, uh, that type of thing. But bigger, I think Mr. Roselli brought up the fact that there is a, uh, there are statewide uh, plans. There are town plans. And the current legislation does not call for an, for an operator to meet those plans, not directly. And so they basically, uh, in building a huge, energy facility in a town of Boroughville can dismiss the Boroughville Comprehensive Plan, which has had years of development. They can also dismiss the statewide Comprehensive Plan, which has had even more time. And so I would think that in part of the local control, that these items will be put into the legislation to have to be considered. Um, and that would take out some of this NIMBY argument, this, you know, not in my backyard. It, if the thing, if, if, a, if, a, if a facility cannot pass muster with the comprehensive plans of the state, county, and town, then it doesn't belong in anybody's backyard. And so it doesn't have to be uh, people with torches running up to the state house. It simply, it simply is, would be common sense, okay? Statewide plan calls for this area in the town of Boroughville to be one of the most unique, one of the most important um, environmental areas in the state of Rhode Island, in the area of New England, and the United States of America. Then why would we ever, ever consider a major power plant in that area? Why would we consider, when we look at an area that uh, that airplanes use for navigation because it's one of the few dock areas left in the town in, in the uh, state of Rhode Island. Why would we ever consider that? So, so if we were to consider statewide plans and town plans as part of local control in the new legislation, some of these um, plans would get approved because they fit the plan, and some would never make it to. Uh, to, to the uh, process because they absolutely do not fit the plan. And so the, the bottom line is why have a plan if it doesn't control what you're putting in your town? Your plan is good for garages and solar panels and uh, highways, but your plan means nothing when a, a major energy facility is going to be sited in your town because you don't want it in your backyard. Well, that's what a comprehensive plan is. A comprehensive plan is what do we want and how do we want it? And that's what the state plan is. That's what the, that this is a lot of time and effort put into these plans, a lot of sweat, a lot of tears. Uh, we're in the process right now in Boroughville. It's not a joke. It's not something we whip up on, a, on like I did with this. It's serious and it should be taken seriously in any new legislation, comprehensive plans in the process, because if we don't, then let's just not have comprehensive plans to save some money. Scrap them, throw them in the garbage, throw them in with the other 1,500,000 documents, whatever it is. <laughs> you know, because I mean, it, 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 seriously, why have them? If they're, not given, if they're not given weight, then why have them? That's not 
uh, Uncle Jenny and Aunt, Aunt Josephine and me going up to the, the, to the uh, EFSB and Uncle Kenny going up to the EFSB and, and saying we don't want no, no power plant. That's saying it doesn't fit in this area. Let's find an area where it does fit. Any further questions for Councilman Trank? Mr. Olkowski. Councilman Trank, thank you. Uh, Olkowski, thank you. I want to address one thing. So you mentioned um, quite a bit about the comprehensive plan and uh, plants uh, as part of this process potentially not conforming with the comprehensive plan. And um, I think we've heard some concern that's been voiced that no plant would get approved in any community if we gave the local community any any say in that process. Um, but uh, you know, in your experience going through the particular process, um, do you feel that communities would uh, ultimately put their hand up? And, and you know, and maybe as part of this process, have you seen communities that have put their hand up to uh, to host uh, either the project or part of the project? Well, a big one that everybody drives by every day is Brayton Point. It's in, it's in neighboring Massachusetts. Um, that area has been a power plant for years. They are now actively looking for something to move in there. They have a, 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 an alternative energy company that's looking to do something there. I think that, yes, there would be uh, communities. We've heard that, uh, uh, that Johnston welcomed the, uh, the landfill. I think Tiverton did too. I think, uh, exactly, Tiverton voted for, for a casino. So, but there are, um, there are communities that are looking for the help, that are looking for the money, that, um, that may not have the, uh, the environmental uh, uh, beautiful locations that, that Barville has. And um, I went to a uh, learn the facts uh, uh, demonstration one time, and I learned something very, very uh, unique, and that is that uh, communities around Rhode Island uh, routinely vote for uh, bond issues to buy lands to set them aside. And uh, the question was posed, well, what town do you think votes the highest on um, setting aside land? And you'd think, you know, Barville, Foster, Gloucester, no, Central Falls, because they don't have any. So yes, I think there are communities that want to host things, um, and I think there are communities that don't. But I don't think it should be willy-nilly. I think it should be done by these plans. These plans should be consulted, and then any opposition should be tied into that plan, um, as with the community who wants to host one. They should make sure that they pass muster as far as their plan is concerned. They may have to, uh, they may have to uh, um, modify their plan in order to uh, host a facility. But either way, it's using a plan that's there, that's published, that people know about, and I think that's really the only way to make this a fair process, and that's use the comprehensive plans that are in place and whether a community wants to host or something or if it doesn't. Thank you, thanks for your perspective. Uh, Councilman Pacheco. Thank you, Cam. Thank you, Ray, for being here and, and thank you everybody else who's testified. Um, I feel like we're family. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to um, reinforce some of the comments that uh, Mr. Trank made because I was part of that uh, tour around the state and testifying in front of a number of town councils throughout the state. And that even if, even if a council member in another town felt like it was a NIMBYism issue or it was a Barville issue, the lack of local control resonated every time, every single time, no matter who it was. I believe every single of those resolutions were unanimous. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to mention, because I'll expound on this as we go forward, um, you made a comment about the fire districts and they should be forced to, or have to approach them to discuss what they're gonna do. They're included, yeah. Absolutely. Um, Mr. Alquist has a nice little paragraph here in his written testimony. And um, it kind of, it goes as, they asked for expedited dockets, meaning the applicant, to rush applications through the process, theme rolling the approval process to get ahead of possible community resistance. When instead, this is the key, this is the key here, when instead 
They should be developing trusted relationships with communities. That would help. Honestly, explaining the advantages and dangers of their proposals, which we haven't gotten, um, and working with communities to understand rather than sneak around their concerns, which we have 15,000 plus pages of uh, data requests trying to get answers that don't require 15,000 pages, excuse me. So um, yeah, I agree with all that and I, I agree with this statement and I, I thank you for being here, it was important. Well, you're welcome, President Pacheco. And one of, the, one of the things that, that happened when we were out touring around getting these resolutions, we found that we have a lot more in common with communities than you would think. The night we were in, uh, I did all the islands, by the way, Portsmouth included, um, and Block Island. Thank you, Paul. Um, one of the things we found, I'll give you Jamestown as an example. You wouldn't think there'd be any two towns different than Boroughville and Jamestown. But they were talking about outdoor gun ranges, they were talking about uh, uh, second, right, uh, second Amendment rights, and that's Barville. And so we, we found going around that there were some towns that, that uh, for one reason or another, didn't uh, jump on board. There were seven of them. And, but we found that, that most towns we had something in common, if not a lot in common with. So that's why I think the comprehensive plan, especially the statewide comprehensive plan, is a good place to start because I truly believe that we have more in common than we, than we do against each other. So. Thank you, Councilman. Any questions? Thank you very much. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. I just wanted to... Well, one of the things about Barovo is we have an energy facility. So, so, yeah, and I mean, but this particular area is addressed because a, a power plant was going to go here. The original power plant that we have was going to go in this area. And this area has got a lot of land set aside for, uh, for environmental purposes. So, yeah, I mean, and, and then the other thing is, is that there are areas in the town that are identified for development. And so it, it, it's not a case of Barville's closed for business. That's not the idea. But there isn't a comprehensive plan, particularly uh, you'd probably be more familiar with the area of the 102 where Wright's Farm is. That area is designated as an area for development, uh, both business, uh, not residential. The, the residential would try to get in, in the village uh, areas. But so there are areas in Barville that are deemed to, to, to we do want to develop. And if you know any businesses who want to come, uh, we, can, we can talk to you about that. But, but there are areas such as the one we're talking about that are deemed not for uh, development, not, not a place to be developed. It's a place of beauty. It's a place to uh, hike and to camp and to enjoy nature. So yes, there are areas of, of Barville and there are areas in a comprehensive plan that are identified for, for uh, development. This isn't one of them. And just because um, committee member uh, David Chenevy's, um microphone wasn't on, the question you were answering for those listening at home is, does the Boroughville uh, Comprehensive Plan address power plants? You can hear it in this room fine, but if you're listening uh, at home, you, you probably couldn't hear that question. Um, and in fact, this, the land where the Invergy plant is proposed is far, designated as farmland, is that correct? A Zoned lot of as farm, yeah. yeah. No problem. It happens, it happens all the time. Um, any further questions for Councilman Trank? Thank you very much.